How do the weapons introduced in the Dark Horizon DLC fare on Apocalypse? The third and final expansion added two long guns, two handguns, and three melee weapons. Since I began recording, many of these weapons have been changed in some way, and as we speak, there are even more changes down the road. Mechanically, they do still function the same, so whether you're watching this as it airs or months later, the information in this video should still help. Starting off with arguably the most complex and devastating weapon of the bunch is Monorail. This black hole powered railgun, as it currently stands, is the strongest weapon in Remnant 2. When I first wrote this section of the script, I was under the assumption that there was no chance that it was going to stay as overpowered as it is. As patches came out and time passed by, uh, it actually got a damage buff. What the fu- That being said, let's break down how it works. Monorail is a charge-based weapon that can naturally pierce targets. It only has three shots in the mag, each one sending the player sliding backwards upon firing. Charging up the weapon increases its base damage by up to plus 200%. You heard me right, base damage. This means that damage buffs from rings, necklaces, archetypes, etc. are applied after the charge. This leads to the completely batshit insane numbers you've probably seen in clips featuring the weapon. However, like Uncle Ben once said, with great power comes great likelihood of dying to a black hole. Trust me, it's from the comics. When reaching full charge and still holding the trigger, the weapon will begin to flash a warning and beep, warning the player of imminent doom. In this state, the weapon checks once every 6 frames to see if you'll die instantly. The default chance is 33% per check. This means you have a pretty high probability of setting it off when overcharging. The legendary bonus, Luck of the Devil, reduces the chance down to a measly 3% every 6 frames. There's still a tiny possibility of immediate death, but it's far less likely. In all honesty though, it's really not worth the risk to fully charge the weapon. At least not without the mod. The difference between a 95% charge and a full charge is so minimal you're better off just letting go early. Its mod, Recoil Dampener, reloads and buffs the weapon for 20 seconds. This effect grants 25% faster charge speed, reduces recoil and sway by 75%, and increases crit chance and crit damage by up to 20% depending on the charge, gaining 1% to both for each 5% of the charge meter filled at the time of release. It also disables the random instant death check, instead replacing it with a set timer of 2.15 seconds. This window of time also increases the base damage ceiling boost to plus 900%. So not only does the mod make the weapon charge consistent, it also hyper-inflates the reward for doing so. Those with a keen ear will notice a metal whistling sound around 1.8 seconds. This serves as a pretty good warning to let go. The knockback time from each shot is static, nothing can change how long you'll be slip sliding around. Funnily enough, you are actually immune to being staggered during the knockback. Now it's time for the build. A few others have shown off one similar to this before. Hunter's Focus plus Wormhole allows you to push the damage even further. I ran Worn Dog Tags, Archer's Crest, Akari Warband, Probability Cord, and Ring of Flawed Beauty. For Fragments, I ran Crit Chance, Crit Damage, and Weak Spot Damage. Then there's the Prism. Okay, time for a mini rant. Prisms have sort of thrown a wrench into the design method for my testing videos. Their existence makes every build magnitude stronger than they ever were previously. Bad weapons get a boost by having access to more damage, reload speed, fire rate, etc. But by extension, the same also applies to already good and strong options. Then there's the legendary bonuses. Like, why would you not pick plus 60% range damage on weapons with poor DPS? Oh, I know why, because the damn thing refuses to roll. To all my console viewers out there, I am so sorry. Prisms take so much time to grind, and getting screwed over by RNG only to have to flush them and start all over again would make me not even want to engage with the system. I am not inherently against the concept of prisms, I just think their implementation could have been handled far better. Thankfully, we've already got some changes to alleviate the grinding pains. Hell, as I've been writing the scripts, we've gotten two updates with the third one in the works to cut the grinding in half. We definitely need that because, oh my god, why was the required XP from 50 to 51 quadrupled? Ah! Beyond whatever gripes I have with the system, I am still left with one question. How the hell do I implement prisms into my videos? When any gun can get a massive damage boost, of course they're going to perform much better than if they didn't have access to it. The way I see it, I can do one of three things. A. Pretend like the prism system does not exist and keep making videos without them, thus keeping my builds accessible to all. B. Say fuck it and go whole hog, including prisms in all future builds, console players be damned. Or C. Discuss weapons, archetypes, gear, etc. on a baseline and only bring up prisms when needed, in the case of something that desperately needs a bigger stat boost, i.e. Godsplitter. 
I honestly have no clue which is the best for my series. Let me know what you think in the comments. As for the rest of this video, I'll be going with option B. Sorry console peeps. Alright, rant over. For my prism, I honestly had an unoptimized one going into my fights, and even then I was still able to kill bosses in basically two or three shots. Just look at this clip. One, two, dead. If I had Sharpshooter and a more optimized setup, she would have been dead in just one. As for some tips when using the weapon, be sure not to be too close to platform edges when firing it. In boss fights like Custodian's Eye, it's super easy to launch yourself off and die. That's pretty much it. This beast is so powerful, it really only takes getting used to the timing to master the weapon. Genesis features the lowest base damage, ideal range, and a max ammo of all the bows. It also has the slowest draw speed of the bunch as well. It makes up for these downsides with its unique charging mechanic. Drawing the bow increases the number of arrows fired, up to 5 when fully charged. This makes the real base damage 750, although it does a little over that, probably to do with how charge weapons calculate their damage. Its mod, Mega Drive, marks a target you're aiming at and applies entanglement. While a target is entangled, shots from Genesis will generate a homing projectile to deal 35% of a regular arrow's damage. These appear shortly after impact with either the target, a wall, or another enemy. They'll even pass through terrain to make it happen. A fully charged volley will deal an extra 1.75 arrows of damage against entangled enemies. These projectiles can weak spot hit, however it's highly dependent on the enemy type whether or not they'll connect. Since the weapon fires multiple projectiles in a sequence, it can be a bit of a challenge to land all of them consecutively. Projectile speed bonuses from sources like Archer's Crest should be more than enough to help. Be sure to also grab a few sources of charge speed too. You can really tell it has the slowest draw speed of every bow. Consider investing in ammo reserves as well. 20 arrows will be gone in no time, especially if you do invest into charge speed. For my build, I went with Hunter Gunslinger, using Hunter's Focus and Bulletstorm for my skills. For trinkets, I ran Worn Dog Tags, Archer's Crest, Tolerance Band, Strand of Sinew, and Feathery Binding. For the Mutator, you know I went with Supercharger. For Fragments, I went with Crit Chance, Crit Damage, and Weak Spot Damage. For my Prism, I grabbed Firearm Charge Time, Longevity, Sniper, Munitions, Meta, and Sharpshooter. And as expected, the weapon absolutely shreds through bosses. Kinda nuts we got not one, but two insanely strong long guns in the DLC. As for tips, advice, etc., I really don't have any. If you've used the other bows, or even the trend of the crossbow, you'll have no problem using this one. Repair Tool is an interesting concept for a handgun. It's a heat-based beam pistol that heals allies and restores energy to Nerudian tech. It heals allies for 3% of their max HP per second, and 5% of a Nerudian device's energy per second so long as the beam is touching them. The healing aspect is kind of nice. It's a pocket mini-beam of sorts. It even scales with healing effectiveness. The energy restoration, however, does not. It is fixed at 5%. No amount of skill cooldown or healing effectiveness will change it. Fire rate bonuses have no effect on it either. If anything, you would actually want a slower fire rate to waste less ammo while trying to heal or restore energy. This makes the energy restoration aspect almost a non-factor. For role-playing purposes, it's fine, but you're spending ammo to restore energy when you could just shoot the enemy. There are far better ways of restoring energy to Nerudian tech, like putting it away, using a relic while it's away, or just using Ring of Ordinance. That one actually scales with skill cooldown. As far as it goes for being a weapon, it's fine. Even good with setups using the newly added exhaust valve. Statistically, it's about on par with something like the MP60 in terms of total damage output. Most other automatic secondaries out there have a 10% crit chance and based 100% weak spot damage though. However, Repair Tool does have zero recoil and perfect accuracy, which is kinda nice. As mentioned, it can overheat, taking 75 shots to do so. This is a fairly generous amount. Even when Exhaust Valve wasn't in play, I barely found myself overheating it. Even still, the weapon's low crit chance and reduced weak spot damage really holds it back from being among the best. For my builds, I used Hunter's Mark and Bulletstorm. For my trinkets, I used Exhaust Valve, Constant Variable Ring, Feeding Tube, Braided Thorns, and Akari Warband. My mod and mutator consisted of corrosive rounds and bottom heavy. For my fragments and prism, I went with crit chance, crit damage, weak spot damage, a small health boost, meta, longevity, gunfighter, munitions, and sharpshooter. 
as I previously mentioned, the weapon performs similarly to the MP60, just slower with a much larger mag size and heat mechanic of course. At first, I thought the reduced weak spot damage would be a deterrent, but the increased base damage compared to the other auto secondaries balances the scale. If anything at all were to change about the weapon, I'd say give the Nerud tech side some love. Whether it be no ammo consumption when shooting it, better energy regen, or buffing the tech in some way. Also, for the love of god, stop the drone from flying away when aiming at it, good lord. Since writing this section, some changes are coming to it regarding its heat generation and ideal range. Neither of these aspects were really a problem with the weapon, but I won't say no to buffs, no matter how minor. Redeemer is possibly one of the best handguns in the game. It's a shotgun pistol with a very unique mod. Its damage was recently buffed and it feels way better. 207 puts it in the upper end of handguns in terms of raw damage. Its pellets fire in a fixed triangle spread. This makes it easy to land all three, even at long range. Moving does cause the spread to widen a bit, but it's so small that it might as well not even be there. Redeemer's mod is Aftermath. It can only be charged by using a relic. Although, there is one other method I'll go over shortly. Once activated, it functions like Healing Shot, giving the user an arc path when aiming. Firing the mod will launch a copy of your currently equipped relic. On impact or collision with a human ally, it'll burst, applying its effects to all players within 4 meters. It is affected by AoE size buffs. This effectively doubles your relic charges, and gives you a way to heal your friends for way more than Healing Shot could. You can even apply shields, give them lifesteal, infinite stamina, you name it. You could even be funny and troll your friends by running Brokenheart. Do note that only the active effects will be applied to allies. Passive benefits like health regen, lifesteal, or extra iframes will not transfer over. The downsides of the weapon are its reload speed, and dependency on needing to use your relic. Although that last part is rarely an actual downside, most archetypes have a relic perk that greatly aids them when active. Therefore, needing to use your relic once in a while isn't really that bad of a requirement. Granted, if your relic use speed is low, you may end up wasting time by trying to use it repeatedly in combat with nothing built around it. On its own, you can just use Redeemer as a back pocket extra relic charge every time you use yours. In a dedicated set up, however, it can get pretty crazy. The launched relic even benefits from the target's relic efficacy, healing effectiveness, and shield duration. The other method I mentioned earlier is using the newly added Chef Metal in tandem with Artful Dodger from the Prism system. Chef Metal mimics the use of a relic whenever you perfect dodge. This alone has a myriad of benefits. It procs both of your archetype relic perks, which can be really powerful ones, like Override from Invader, or Sleight of Hand from Gunslinger. It also procs any on-relic use rings you might have equipped, like Ring of Bones, Transient Cord, or Blessed Ring. Throw an Artful Dodger, which makes any dodge you perform perfect with a 3 second cooldown, and you have a combo that has a 100% uptime on everything associated with relic use, including Redeemer. Every 3 seconds you get a free relic charge, no medic required. This alone is absolutely OP. With select relic choices, you'll essentially be unkillable. Using Bloodless Heart with Preservation, a Fragment or two, Artful Dodger, Chef Metal, and Redeemer gives you nearly infinite invincibility. For my build, I went with Gunslinger and Vader, Bulletstorm and Reboot being my skills. My trinkets were Chef Metal, Frivolous Band, Akari Warband, Symbol of Royalty, and Blessed Ring. For my Mutator, I went with Extender. You could use Bandit if you really want to, although I find the guaranteed 9 shots from Extender perfectly lines up with Artful Dodger's cooldown. For my Relic, I bounced between Quilted Heart and Decayed Heart. Quilted Heart gives you access to unlimited stamina, while Decayed Heart gives you unlimited reactive healing. This weapon is incredible. The possibilities of Aftermath are endless. It's a blast to use in both solo and co-op play. Now that its damage is higher, it actually contends with the other single-shot pistols. If I had to choose between using this or something like Rupture Cannon, I'm gonna go with Redeemer. Its utilities are just way too good, even in an average setup. It doesn't deal the highest damage or even have all that good of DPS, but it's the mod that makes it. Up next is Black Great Sword. This is the heaviest weapon in the game, and when I say heaviest, I mean it's the only weapon that increases your armor encumbrance when equipped. Donning this hunk of metal will add 15 pounds to your character. That's a pretty hefty downside. This additional weight will push any light set into medium, some mediums into heavy, and two heavies into ultra. Depending on which set you prefer, you may want to invest into strong back to counteract the weight increase. Now let's talk about the actual weapon. Black Greatsword has its own unique moveset unlike the other blades in its category. 
the basic three head combo features a left, right, and overhead swing. The neutral swing is not a swing, but a kick. And its sprint attack is a shoulder charge. While definitely cool looking, the charge attacks are what make up the meat of this cast iron skillet. Charging any attack with Black Greatsword will grant you stacks of Indomitable. With no sources of charge speed, you gain 2 stacks a second while charging. When you have at least 1 stack, you gain 15% damage reduction, all damage you take is converted to Grey Health, and you're immune to being staggered. Stacks max out at 10. And for each stack accumulated, you'll deal an additional 25% damage per swing, up to 250% more damage. Stacks also last the entirety of the swing animation, not being removed until you regain full control of your character. On paper, this sounds awesome. A bunch of defensive benefits combined with a huge boost in damage? Sign me up! Well, it's actually got some pretty big flaws. First of all is that damage boost. It's not like monorails. This is an additive bonus. That means it gets lumped with pretty much every other source of damage increase, be it perk, gear, skill, you name it. If it were like monorail's base damage increase, then it would be way stronger. I'm not saying we need a monorail of the melee weapons. What I mean is that this damage bonus is not nearly as impactful as it seems. Now, why is that? Well, for starters, the charge time for the weapon is incredibly slow. Thankfully, you do get some really good defensive bonuses while charging, but that doesn't make it necessarily worth the investment. For a comparison, take any other greatsword, or even Wrathbringer. Those weapons have charge attacks that are immediately paid off by swinging the second they are done charging. They deal anywhere from 70% to 130% more damage depending on which charge attack you perform. And the best part, they don't have a 5 second charge time to deal with and their stamina cost is per attack instance. Black Greatsword constantly needs stamina to charge up. You can even end up overcharging and wasting stamina without any extra benefit. This makes it risky to continually charge back to back. That leads to another problem. You need to charge back to back to gain the sword's benefits. At that point, you might as well just use one of the other Greatswords that has a flat stamina cost per charge attack. The weapon is also just super slow in general. Sealed Resin Loop is a must-have in my mind. Unless you Omega stack sources of attack and charge speed, you'll often be a sitting duck after heavy swings. An armored duck, but a duck nonetheless. So what can we do to help out this big hunk of iron? As mentioned before, stacking charge speed can help. In fact, all sources of melee attack speed increase the stack gain rate. There's also three items that have a secret interaction with the weapon. Whispering Marble, Berserker's Crest, and the Guts Mutator. Each one grants the sword 10% faster stack accumulation while equipped. We also have the Fragments from the Prism System, and Juggernaut from Challenger. You could also run Frenzy Dust from Alchemist, but I opted to use Stone Mist for a bit more protective power. Besides defense though, there is one more reason. There seems to be some sort of bug if you stack too many sources of attack speed. Like in this setup here, for some reason the stack cap becomes 9. But if I put on Whispering Marble, it becomes 10 again, which then becomes 9 again if I take it off. My trinkets of choice were Decayed Margin, Leech Ember, Brawler's Pride, Berserker's Crest, and Sealed Resin Loop. My mutator of choice was Edgelord. I could have gone with Guts, it would make sense considering I'd be getting hit more often than not while charging, but I wanted a bit more Leech per swing. For my relic, I went with Profane Heart, making sure to invest in Leech and Siphoner for maximum lifesteal. For my fragments, I went with Melee Speed, Melee Crit Chance, and Evade Speed. On my Prism, I had Health, Tank, Rogue, Hulk, Warrior, and Hyperactive. Even with all of these speed in the world, the weapon still feels underwhelming to use in any major fight. The time I spent charging over and over just to deal above average damage leaves me asking myself why am I not just using a different melee? Especially with the other two added in this DLC, Black Greatsword just feels like the black sheep, no pun intended, of the bunch. I want to like the weapon. I really do. So what would I change about the weapon to make it feel better? Instead of the stacks of Indomitable being gained and lost per charged swing, what if the stacks gained stayed for a duration? That way you could get the benefits of the DR, Grey Health Conversion, and Stagger Immunity while using the basic swings too. You could then also use the charged swings like they were a normal greatsword. If you lost stacks, you could just consume the stamina needed to regain them and then get back to the action. This would let Black Greatsword keep the interaction with the 
Berserk items increasing stat gain rate. The weapon would then fully benefit from total melee attack speed sources, since you wouldn't be forced to always do these slow-ass charge attacks to gain the weapon's benefits. This would make the plus 15 weight from having it equipped a lot more worth it too, since you'd be getting some pretty damn good defensive buffs for having the effect basically all the time with good management. One change would vastly improve the weapon, just to make the stacks duration-based, and if they really needed to, the damage buff per stack could be adjusted if it were deemed too high. The charged attack motion values could also then be upped to match that of the others. I kind of can't believe they're the same as the normal swings. While an interesting concept, it's not one I see myself returning to unless some changes are made. And I've seen the changes proposed on Twitter, I don't think they're going to help the weapon very much. It'll be better, sure, but it doesn't solve the root problems of the weapon. Coming up, we have the unarmed weapon to completely wipe the floor with the knuckle dusters. The dark matter gauntlets are an awesome addition to the melee roster. They feature the same 1-2 combo, neutral attack, and neutral charge attack as the base unarmed moveset. It's the basic charged attack where things get interesting. Doing so will empower the gauntlets for 15 seconds, increasing standard swing damage by 25%, and causing each charge attack to perform a unique forward jab. This move shoots out an 8 meter penetrating beam of damage. This scales with AoE size increases and provides pretty good ad clear potential. While empowered, each charge swing takes about a second away from the duration. The physical gauntlet hit from charge swings during this time will do basic swing damage plus the empower damage bonus. When the duration ends, you can charge attack again to power the gauntlets back up. There does appear to be a bug where sometimes if you power attack right at the end of the duration, it'll put a 2 second cooldown on re-empowering them. A penalty normally given by another attack we'll get to in a minute. During this cooldown, any charge attacks will be the normal standard on our moveset ones. Now on to the piece de resistance, the empowered neutral charge attack. While the gauntlets are empowered, performing the neutral charge attack will cause the player to enter a charging phase. Here the player can charge the weapon for up to 5 seconds. Upon releasing, the player will fire off a massive beam of dark matter. Neither projectile speed or AoE size increases seems to have an effect on the beam. Not that you'll realistically ever need to hit someone from far away. During the attack, you can slightly adjust your aim. You can even swap shoulders, but you are certainly limited. You are also locked in this attack until the beam is fully depleted. So be sure to use the attack wisely, or at least run sealed resin loop. This attack, much like Black Greatsword, consumes a large amount of stamina to charge. If you run out of stamina mid-charge, you'll be forced to fire off whatever you did have charged. Do watch out when trying to charge the beam with little to no stamina. It's very possible to just have the weapon short out and start the cooldown with nothing happening at all. The damage, though, is actually worth the investment, especially with the right setup. The beam scales with melee and unarmed damage, but that varies from enemy to enemy. The beam can also be used at any point of the gauntlet's empowerment. You can wait until the absolute last second and then begin charging the beam. With the right playstyle, you can get some serious value from these gauntlets. For my build, I went with Challenger Handler, using Juggernaut and Attack Dog to get major benefits from their associated buffs to melee damage and stamina cost reduction. For trinkets, I ran Butcher's Fetish, Demolition Coil, Tarnished Ring, Meteorite Shard Ring, and Sealed Resin Loop. For my weapons, I used Monolith and Nebula to increase my damage against targets a bit more. And for my Mutator, I went with Volatile Strike. For this build and the next, I'm pretty much using the same Relic and Prism, just with a few different base fragments and a different Legendary. Here I chose Wrecking Ball. These gauntlets have insane potential. In this build, every tick of the beam damage is causing an explosion from Demolition Coil, and every second, Volatile Strike procs. Both explosions are dealing guaranteed crits thanks to Wrecking Ball, leading to some pretty absurd damage, especially when boosted from our unarmed damage rings, of which Demolition Coil is also being affected by. Against certain bosses, this leads to clears in literal seconds, this is basically the monorail of the melee weapons. It's not perfect, of course. Bosses that move around frequently or teleport can easily evade the beam, which is why I run Sealed Resin Loop. Speaking of, there is a bug that currently exists when using the ring that will probably get changed soon. The bug effectively lets you pre-charge the beam to instantly fire off when you perform a neutral charge attack again. Here's how it's done. Charge up the beam, like you would, and then dodge as soon as you begin to fire. If done at the beginning of the empower duration, you can reposition and then perform the attack again to instantly fire the beam off. Learning about this was immediately game-changing, although I highly doubt this will stay for long. As long as you manage your stamina effectively, you'll be able to kill bosses pretty effortlessly. 
finally we have the last weapon of the bunch, Harvester Scythe. When I picked up this weapon during the DLC, I instantly knew it would undoubtedly be the best of the three scythes. It has the highest base damage and crit chance of them, so it's already better in that regard. Its moveset is the same as the other two, with the benefit of summoning a Phantom Scythe that mimics your charge attacks. This Phantom Scythe moves a bit forward from where you were at the time of charge attacking. This can cause it to fly by smaller targets, although on bosses this rarely happens. When the Phantom Scythe hits a target, you'll gain a 6% stack of bonus melee attack speed and charge speed. This stacks up to 5 times, totaling to 30% increased melee attack speed. This is leagues above the Steel Scythe and especially the Ritualist Scythe. Seriously, how has that thing not gotten a buff yet? The math has been done. The Steel Scythe is just better. There isn't much else to say about the Harvester Scythe. It's simply just stronger than the other two options. For my build, I once again went with Juggernaut and Stone Mist. My trinkets included Butcher's Fetish, Brawler's Pride, Bisected Ring, Burden of the Destroyer, and Token of Favor. Same guns as last time, and I used Shocker as my mutator. Shocker pairs exceptionally well with the weapon, as the charged attacks can hit three times on their own, leaving the Phantom Scythe to land the final hit and unleash the lightning. My Prism Legendary here was Jack of All Trades. I think the game was trying to tell me to stop at this point, as when I went to fight my usual melee punching bag, Cancer, this happened. Now, pardon my language, but what the fuck happened here? Oh, and I didn't pass out while editing here. The game just hard freezes after killing him like this. I did the fight again. This is a consistent crash. Very strange. The weapon is, as you can tell, very strong. Two out of the three melee weapons in this DLC are exceedingly powerful. I just wish Black Greatsword could have gotten the same treatment. There we have it, every single weapon in Remnant 2 tested on Apocalypse difficulty. Unless Gunfire pulls a surprise fourth DLC out of its hat, this will probably be the last time I ever cover the weapons in great detail. I still have to cover the archetypes, as well as make a few other videos on some general R2 stuff. I seriously appreciate your amazing support on this journey I've had over the past 15 months. Without your feedback and encouragement, I wouldn't be here making these videos. So once again, thank you all. The Gunslinger video will probably be my next project, although I might put out a poll for what you all think I should work on next. Let me know in the comments which weapon from the DLC is your favorite. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one.